Thank you, Vince and Melanie and Bao. Hey, uh, it's great to see you. If you are new here, I just wanted to mention we uh, have these books, All Things New, at the entryway, which talks a little bit about uh, our church and what we believe in. You're welcome to pick one of these up on your way out. Also, if you're new, uh, it's important to know that uh, we really have an open communion table. The whole sermon is always about communion, and you're welcome, uh, more than welcome, to uh, participate. And my wife wanted me to mention that uh, if there, you run out of, uh, if we run out over here, we have a station over here as well. Y you'll notice that our big uh, object that was in the sanctuary last week is gone, the big tent, revealing the beginning of the new uh, elevator. So we're pretty excited about that so people don't have to take the stairs. Right now, are you waving at me, Steve, for a reason? Oh, you're excited about it, right. I always worry that my zipper's down, but I think I'm good. Okay, let's pray. Father, we ask that you would help us to preach. Uh, Lord God, I pray that you would help us to see your glory. And I thank you that your glory is Jesus the Christ. And Lord, where he shows up is utterly shocking. So I pray that you would help us to believe. Help us to receive your word. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Hey, uh, I feel sorry for doing this, but at some point, I do think that we need to bring this into the, into the light, no matter how confusing and painful it, it may be. This is uh, John MacArthur, Protestant Pope and Chancellor Emeritus of the Master's University and Seminary in Santa Clarita, California, explaining penal substitutionary atonement Theory. Now, I've edited this for length, but you're free to get the transcript, and it'll have a, a link to watch the whole thing online. Okay, Sasha, play, play the film. If you don't understand the doctrine of penal substitution, you don't know why Christ died. How is it possible for me to be reconciled to holy God without him not tarnishing his holiness? Or to put it in the language of Paul, how can God be just and the justifier of sinners? In Christianity, the question is built around holiness and justice and righteousness. So how can God forgive me and still be holy? And the only thing that answers that question is penal substitution. Because penal substitution says God is so holy, every sin will be punished. Every single sin in the life of every Christian believer through all of human history will be punished, was punished. All sin must be punished. Either the sinner will bear that punishment eternally or Christ took that punishment on the cross. There has to be a punishment for God to maintain his justice. That punishment falls on his son. And so God is so pure and holy that he will punish every single sin ever committed by every person, either in that person or in the substitute for that person. That is the purest heart of Christianity and soteriology. So that's uh, John MacArthur's version of penal substitutionary atonement theory, um, uh, which is the most uh, recent formulation of an atonement theory in, in the United States of America and, and wasn't around in that form up until the Reformation, but it was in, in, in maybe other forms. Penal substitutionary atonement theory, and MacArthur said the heart of his religion, but the heart of God is not a, a theory, it's Jesus. From the bosom of the Father, Jesus is the heart of God hanging on a tree in a garden. Atonement theories postulate answers to these three questions. Why did Jesus have to die on the cross? What was the reason for that? And then secondly, what does it mean? It is the reason for what? In other words, those two questions maybe could be summed up with this third one. How do we judge the judgment of God? So much of what MacArthur said is right, and yet the way he said it and what we hear when he says it can be so profoundly wrong, maybe even satanic. In the words of N.T. Wright, instead of hearing God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, 
what we hear is God so hated the world that he murdered his only begotten son. Instead of preaching that God saves us from our bad judgment with his good judgment, we end up preaching that we save ourselves from God's bad judgment with our own good judgment, which comes from the knowledge of Jesus dying on a tree, which comes from religious leaders who take that knowledge of good and evil from a book. And so to save ourselves, we take that knowledge and apply it to our lives to make ourselves in the image of God, and we call that faith. And yet that sounds vaguely satanic, doesn't it? We preach that we need to save ourselves from God. Why? Because God is not one. We preach that he's divided between love and not love that we call justice or righteousness or holiness. We preach that he's divided, changeable, and limited, so it's our good judgment which changes his bad judgment from torture to salvation. Or maybe it's Jesus the good God which changes the thinking of the bad God, our creator, or maybe God just changes for no reason. You know, choosing to be merciful to some and eternal torment to others, why? Well, just because he can. We seem to preach that God is kind of like bloodthirsty, a bloodthirsty God. And yet it was us that tore his flesh and took his blood on the tree. And isn't it him who commands us to drink his blood and take his broken body? See, there's definitely something that's right about the idea of penal substitutionary atonement, and yet what's right seems to get so twisted that it becomes the very, well, almost the very definition of evil. Was it God that took the life of Christ on a tree in a garden? We've been studying uh, this picture, which is also this picture, which is also this picture. Who's bloodthirsty in this picture? Who wants to eat whom in this picture? Who wants to eat and who, who wants to be eaten? <laughs> who draws blood and who gives blood or maybe even donates blood? Penal substitutionary atonement. It's weird to call that the heart of Christianity when you cannot even find that phrase in your Bible. You can't find the word penal in your Bible, and yet you can find the word punishment. My dad often punished me. You can't find the word substitutional, and yet maybe you can find the word substitute. My dad, my mom, my wife have all been substitutes for me, which is wonderful because they did things that I could not do. And you certainly, you can find the word atonement, not only find the word, it's almost as if all of Scripture is a definition of that word. Atonement basically means at one mint. In Hebrew, it's the word kafar, and kafaret means place of atonement or mercy seat. In Greek, the word kafaret is translated by a word that usually gets translated by the English word, Propitiation, you ever heard that word? Does anybody know what it means? Because in my experience, no one is able to define the English word propitiation, but in the Bible, it always refers to the, the mercy seat on top of the Ark of the Covenant in the holy place between the two cherubim on the holy mountain. The mercy seat was the judgment seat and also the throne of God on earth. The high priest would sprinkle blood on top of the mercy seat on the day of atonement to atone for the, all the unintentional sins of Israel. God asked for blood because he gave all the blood in the first place. The life's in the blood. 
And so the blood would return to the throne in the temple like the blood returns to the heart in your body. It returns so it can be oxygenated and given again for the life is in the blood. The, the breath is in the blood. The spirit is in the blood. Is the heart bloodthirsty? Well, yeah, right? Yeah, but, but, not, but not to hold the blood, to oxygenate the blood and then pump the blood back out to the, to the body. In the Revelation, John sees a slaughtered lamb standing on the throne and he hears every creature in heaven and earth and under the earth praising God and the lamb. Why? Because by his blood he ransomed us for God. He's the heart of God from the bosom of the Father that bleeds for all, for all the members of his body. It's a crazy picture. First John 2, 2, John tells us that Jesus is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only but also the sins of the whole world. And then he writes, in this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Now check this out. Propitiation happens in the holy place on the judgment seat of God. MacArthur asks, how can God forgive me and still be holy, and yet the most holy thing that happens in the most holy place is the forgiveness of sins, which isn't wrong, but the very definition of of the right and the just and the holy. So maybe something's wrong with our theory. Atonement theories are theories because they're theories. The atonement is the judgment of God and Paul will tell us in Romans 11 that the judgments of God are past finding, unsearchable and past finding, finding out, inscrutable. So just because John McCarthy or I have a hard time judging the eternal judgment of God, it doesn't mean that the eternal judgment of God isn't true or doesn't work. And that's another really weird thing about atonement theories. And most of them explain why the atonement doesn't work. Some will say it doesn't work for all because God didn't atone for all. Some will say that God's judgment to atone is dependent on our judgment of God's judgment to atone and so won't work for all for we don't all work. And some will say if you think the atonement works for all, you obviously don't believe in the atonement. Penal substitutionary atonement. Well, there is an atonement. It's the judgment of God, Jesus. And there is a punishment for sin. But the sin is not the reason for the punishment, it seems. It's more like the punishment is the reason for the sin. Remember, that's what we preached on last week, the weird thing we saw in Romans chapter three. It's the judgment of God which punishes sin the judgment of God is the reason for, this, for David's sin, the sin of David in Romans 3, 4 and Psalm 51. The judgment of God, as if absolutely everything begins with the judgment of God, so that we would judge the judgment of God and then justify the judgment with faith and worship, saying, wow, that is an amazingly great judgment. But there's most definitely a punishment for sin. The word punishment appears eight times, eight times in, in my New Testament, in my English Standard Version, but it translates five different Greek words. Some clearly mean something like um, prune or correct or, or discipline. All of them can mean discipline. You know, my dad's punishments were always discipline. Three times the punishment is eternal, but that doesn't mean that the punishment is eternally experienced as punishment. Eternal fire is punishment. That's the same eternal fire that is the very presence of the Lord. Check out this Bible verse, 2 Thessalonians 1.9. Paul writes about the punishment of eternal destruction that comes from the presence of the Lord. Some translators just tra change it to eternal destruction 
uh, the, the, uh, the, the punishment of eternal destruction that, uh, away from the presence of the Lord. But the, the Greek is just abundantly clear. The punishment is the presence of the Lord. Our Lord Jesus who can reduce you to dust. And yet he made you from dust in the first place. So don't you think he could do it again? Paul experienced him as punishment on the road to Damascus. Remember? And then he experienced him and still does experience him as eternal life. You see, the punishments of God can kill you and then raise you from the dead. They're not bad. They're the very presence of the good. The punishment for darkness is light. The punishment for desecration is creation. The punishment for bad judgment is good judgment. The punishment for, for flesh and Hades is the fire that descends upon the altar of sacrifice. The punishment for sin is grace. The punishment for the liar is the presence of the truth. The punishment for the loss is to be found by the way. The punishment for death is the death of death, that is life, eternal, eternal life. So there is an atonement, right? And there is a punishment, and there is a substitution, but maybe not for punishment. <laughs> Penal substitution. God said the day you eat of it, dying, you will die. So do you die? Turn to dust? Isn't that the punishment? Through Ezekiel in chapter 18, verse 20, God says this. The soul who sins shall die. The son shall not suffer for the iniquity of the father, and the father shall not suffer for the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked will be on his self. In other words, no substitutes. Do you think that Jesus came to prove his father a liar? So you can sin and never die? Jesus taught that you must lose your life, your psyche, your soul. He taught that you must lose, that's called death, in order to find it. That's eternal life. Hades is a place for people who refuse to lose their lives, for they insist on saving their souls, and so hide from the punish of punishment of God, which is the judgment of God, which is the atonement of God, which is mercy. It's so profoundly bizarre. I mean, the more I read scripture, it's just so profoundly bizarre to me that evangelical Christians teach people that Jesus died so they wouldn't have to die. When Jesus taught that unless you die, you can never live. He even said you must pick up your cross you know, like the kind he's got. He said, you must pick up your cross and follow me if you want to be my disciple. If we're joined with him in a death like his, writes Paul, we will surely be joined with him in a resurrection like his. He's going to say that in two chapters. Jesus didn't choose to die, so you wouldn't have to die. Jesus died in order to help you choose to die. And that's called faith. It's faith in the judgment of God, our Father. Jesus is not a substitute for the judgment of God, our Father. Jesus is the judgment of God, our Father. And yet Jesus is a substitute for something. He's a substitute for your own bad judgment. Jesus does what you could not do. That is surrender to the judgment of God. That is trust in love. That is have faith in God. That is make a good judgment. That is create yourself, save yourself, and sanctify yourself. Jesus is your righteousness. And faith is reckoned as righteousness because it is. God does not cook the books. I mean, that's the way we've explained it for some reason, that God 
cooks the books. American evangelical church seems to have somehow taught folks that you know you can say a prayer, call it faith, there'll be no discipline for sin, and God will count it as righteousness no matter how unrighteous you are. And then we call that imputed righteousness. Well, God does reckon faith as righteousness, but not because he changes some numbers in a ledger, but because he changes the decisions in your heart, and then he pumps his judgments through your veins. All righteousness is imputed. That means given. All righteousness is imputed because Jesus is righteousness. Apart from him, you can do what, class? Nothing. Nothing. So why did Jesus have to die on that tree? When you ask the question from the frame of reference of the untrue, unfaithful people at the base of this tree, you're bound to come up with an answer that's confusing, absurd, and terrifying. For it will assume that God is divided and changeable and limited like us it will assume that wrong is right, (laughs) like us. But if you ask the question from the frame of reference of the man on the tree, that is the light of the world, that is if you ask him, why do you have to die on that tree? Well, the answer is kind of surprising. He doesn't have to. He wants to. No one takes my life from me, said Jesus. I lay it down of my own accord. And if you ask, what does that accomplish? Everything. Do you remember who he is? He is the word spoken into the void that creates all things. He said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given unto me. That change in perspective is what we've been calling Paul's theological theory of relativity. But it's not just a theory, it's an oracle of God. It's scripture, in other words. Romans 3, which we've been looking at now, there's a third week on Romans 3, and I want you to remember all the sermons we preach on, all the sermons we've ever preached, okay? Romans 3, verse 1. Then what advantage has the Jew or Christian? Or what is the value of circumcision or baptism, for instance, asked Paul, much in every way. To begin with, the Jews or the Christians were entrusted with the oracles of God, Scripture. What if some were unfaithful? Does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? Hell no, is what Paul answers, translated by no means. Let God be true. That's the constant. Though every man is a liar, we're the variable. As it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged, as David in Psalm 51. I have sinned against you and you alone, that you may be justified in your judgments. Verse five, but if our unrighteousness, our wrong, serves to show the righteousness of God, the right, what shall we say, that God is wrong, unrighteous, to inflict wrath on us? I'm speaking in a human way. Hell no, or by no means. For then, otherwise, how could God judge the world? But if through my lie, God's truth abounds to his glory, what's his glory? Abounds to his glory, why am I still being judged as a sinner? And why not do evil that good may come? As some people slanderously charge us with saying, the judgment of them is just. What then, are we Jews, are we Christians any better off or worse off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. That means nobody's got faith, and nobody's even looking for it. Verse 12, all have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of snakes is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift. He's quoting David this whole time. Feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Verse 19, now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be stopped. Every mouth. 
For Paul has already explained, even if the Gentiles do not have the knowledge of good and evil written down in a book and placed on the shelf, they do have the knowledge of good and evil growing on a tree in the garden of their own heart. Verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that, now this is the purpose of the law, right? So that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight since through the law comes knowledge of sin. No one is able to take knowledge from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, apply it to their flesh, and make themselves in the image of God. The problem with flesh is not that it's physical, but it's hopelessly self-centered. It only feels its own pain. It only suffers or feels its own pleasure. Members in a body feel each other's pain, right? And they participate in a communion of pleasure, health. Verse 21, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. The law describes Jesus, but Jesus is Jesus, the righteousness of God. So you can take the life of Jesus, dissect Jesus, and never know Jesus because you've killed Jesus. You've crucified Jesus and are just unrighteous as hell. Verse 21, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through literally the faith of Jesus Christ to all and upon all those Believing, the believing, for there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and, 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 and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation through faith in his blood. I think that means that the faith is in the blood. Like oxygen is in your blood, like spirit, breath, and life is in blood that returns to the heart and then is you know, pumped throughout the whole body. Verse 25, this was to show God's righteousness, his rightness, because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier. Now that's the verse MacArthur quoted, so that he might be literally right. The word just and right are the same word in Greek, that he might be right and the one who makes right and declares right, the one who is of the faith of Jesus or the one who is from the faith of Jesus. So take another look at that tree. What do the men, us, at the base of the tree want? Well, well, don't we, don't they, don't they want to make themselves right by taking the life of the man on the tree? They want to feed their egos by eating his flesh and drinking his blood. They're bloodthirsty. And so they think, so they judge he's bloodthirsty. But what does the man on the tree want? He wants to give them his blood and his body. That's God our Father on that tree, and what does he want? Well, doesn't he want us to see his heart and love as he loves? He wants all his children to pass the ball like we've been talking about. He wants all his children to pass the ball at the great banquet, the banquet of Thanksgiving. He wants all his children to pass the ball and join the fun, so he's passing the ball no matter how much it costs him, because he's faithful and he's true. That's God the Son on that tree, and what does he want? He wants to make us his body, but not by eating us like we eat food and apply it to our own flesh. He wants to make us his body the way a groom makes his bride his body and the two become one flesh. He's romancing us into a communion of ecstatic grace. He wants to make us his body so he can bleed his blood into every member of that body and we would bleed that blood into each other. 
That's God the Spirit on that tree. And what does the Spirit of God want? What does the breath of God want? He wants us to exhale him, <sighs> surrender him, exhale him so that we could inhale him. He wants us to breathe him and stop holding our breath, which is his breath. He wants us to pass the ball, for if we don't pass the ball, we imprison the life <gasps> in the chains of our own unrighteousness, in this body of sin and death. That's love on the tree. And what does love want? He wants us to love, like him. When we judge love in order to justify ourselves, everything dies. But when love judges us, Love justifies us. Love makes us right. And we rise from the dead with faith in love, and love is life. Life is passing the ball. It's the faith of Jesus that finishes you in the image and, right, and likeness of, of God. Verse 27, then what becomes of our boasting? It's excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith, the way of faith. Faith is a decision, remember, to surrender your judgment to another's judgment, and even that judgment, to surrender your judgment, is to the credit of the one to whom you surrender it. In other words, if you boast in your faith, you don't have any. What do you have? Religion, verse 28. For we hold that one is justified, made right by faith, apart from works of the law, works of religion, or is God the God of Jews only, or is he of the Christians only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also, since God is one, since God is undivided, unchanging, and ubiquitous, since God is one who will, who will justify, that is, make right the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Circumcised and uncircumcised. Who else is there? Okay, you can think about this just a little bit. Allow yourself to think about it. I mean, unless there's some kind of weird little clause about, you know, botched circumcisions not getting into heaven. But I don't think that's what Paul meant. He writes, God is one who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. That's everyone. And that means the atonement works. And why does it work? Because it's not your judgment. It's the judgment of God. And God is sovereign. It's so misleading to say that God has to punish sins as if God is beholden to some false God of our own construction that we have named righteousness, justice, or holiness, but is in fact the very opposite of those things. God does not have to do anything. God does not have to punish sins. However, God does want and does make everyone righteous. And yet when you are wrong, you will perceive the wrong as right, and the right as some sort of punishment. You see, to have faith in God is to sacrifice faith in yourself. And we perceive that as death, and it truly is death. But it's not only death. It's our first step into the new creation, which is life. We live by faith. Verse 31, do we then overthrow the law by this faith? Hell no, by no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. So why did Jesus die on the cross? Well, because love is who he is. And what does it mean? It means that you, you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and you will love your neighbor as yourself. And when will this happen? When you let God be true and every man be a liar, when you are judged by the judgment of God. And when will you be judged? Well, it might be right now if, in fact, you are listening to the Word. Living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing the division of soul and spirit. So what's the reason for wrong? The revelation of the right. 
And what's the reason that is right? The word of God, the judgment of God, the atonement of God, Jesus. You can't make it happen. You can only let it happen. And if you think you can make it happen, you're an idiot. I think the very best thing that happened to me all of this past year was that Jesus called me an idiot. He said it using my lips. And then he laughed. This last April, I posted this picture on my Facebook page along with this comment underneath. To God, you are a self-centered idiot. Actually, you are a lovable self-centered idiot. To be more precise, you are a lovable self-centered idiot worth dying for. You are his body. And you have no idea how valuable you are to him or your neighbor is to him. You know, babies really are self-centered little bags of, of dust and poop. If you have one, you know that, right? But we all know that they also contain a miracle, which is the Spirit of God. When Susan and I chose to have children, we chose to suffer their sins. We knew they would be disobedient. <laughs> We chose to have children, and we knew that we would suffer their sins. We knew that we would suffer their sins, for we hope that pain born in love, and we chose to suffer their sins, for we hope that pain born in love would produce something. What is that? People in our own image and likeness and a banquet of love that we would one day call our family. I had absolutely no need to punish them. And I never once thought that any of them could ever pay me back. Well, I posted this online. To God, you are a self-centered idiot. Most people like the post, but one fellow, he really didn't like the post. He was a pastor, and I suspect he'd been deeply hurt. He, he rebuked me online, and he said, God would never call his children idiots. I wrote back and apologized. I explained how I thought we all had an ego. We all had an old man, a body of self-centered flesh. But in that old body of sin and death, God uh, is revealing his resurrection and life. A new man, the new man, in, in the old man, Christ in me. My father loves both, I wrote, and so he laughs with me, at me, and for me. I quoted Paul in Romans eleven thirty two. He consigned all to disobedience, they may have mercy on all. And then I wrote, my father, uh, my earthly father, who loved me as as no other person ever has, used to look at me with a twinkle in his eye when I would be messing around with my friends and he'd say, Peter, you idiot, and then he'd laugh. Well, my Facebook friend really didn't seem to like the idea that God would consign all to disobedience in order to have mercy on all, and he definitely didn't think God would ever call anyone an idiot and then laugh, and so I stressed. It's really stressful to talk about God when you're an idiot. People don't understand how stressful that is. It was about two weeks after that that Susan and I were praying for a friend. For whatever reason, over the years, Susan and I have wound up praying for some friends that have experienced some intense abuse in their past. And so now have to do some really intense spiritual warfare to be liberated from the bondage that's created by that ocean of lies. I wouldn't expect you to believe most of what happens in those sessions, for I don't know many others or any others that have experienced these things. At times, these few friends will just be gone, and demons will manifest. And sometimes Satan will manifest. With this particular friend, I had discovered that the evil one particularly hates it when I pray in tongues. And now I, I just need to tell you, I've always thought that praying in tongues was just kind of ridiculous. Silly. Because I just don't know what I'm saying. And so, of course, I've wondered, am I just making this stuff up? But with this friend, the evil one, well, he just hates it when I pray in tongues. And he can only take it for so long. Then when he leaves, my friend will regain consciousness and check this out, hear Jesus in me. And start having a conversation with Jesus as I just keep praying in tongues and she hears him in English. I mean, that's just like, that's nuts. I, I, I think that's 
crazy, but she tells me what he says, and it is profound. She didn't think it up. Well, this was happening those two weeks after the Facebook post, and, and I was thinking, I don't know what I'm saying. When my friend just started laughing out loud, she blurted out, Jesus just called you an idiot, and then she caught herself. And she said, oh, but you have to understand, it was affectionate. You no, know, like he liked you. He said, this idiot doesn't even know what he's saying. And then he laughed. And I said, oh, wow, that is so awesome, because I was just feeling like an idiot for suggesting that God might call me an idiot, and now I know I'm an idiot, and I know that God knows I'm an idiot, even calls me an idiot through my own mouth, and so laughs with me and for me and, and even in me. Wow, that really takes the pressure off. God already knows I'm an idiot. And yet, the light of the world, the logic of God, the ground of all being, will actually speak through me as if I am an incarnation of him. I've been chewing on that all year. And thinking about this, it might be happening all the time. Because you see, faith in me is Jesus in me. And now fasten your seatbelts because faith in you is not you. It's Jesus in you. Hope in you is not you. It's the spirit of Christ in you. Paul called it the hope of glory, Christ in us. Love in you is not you. Love is not you, and it's not of you. Love is God, God is love. It's God fully filling you, he's fulfilling you. But if you boast as if it is you, well maybe you deliver him up for crucifixion and you imprison yourself in a lie. But even then, there is a reason for the wrong, and what's that? The revelation of the right. The wrong is like a dark void in which the light will be revealed. It's like your sin, which will manifest what? The wonder of grace. It's, it's like an idiot who speaks the word of God. It's like a, a shitty old manger in this world of chaos and pain and suffering that is chosen by God to manifest the very treasures of his heart, Jesus, from the bosom of the Father. What's the reason for wrong? was the revelation of the right. And what's the reason for right? There is no reason for the right. For the right is the reason for everything else. The reason for all things, even including the no things, like sin, death, and hell. So what's the reason that is right? Well, it's Christ. And even Christ in you. Christ in you just like Jesus was in that stinking manger 2,000 years ago. You see, the atonement isn't just some way that God punishes sin. It's how God makes you righteous. The atonement is how God makes you and all things with you. The atonement is the banquet that never ends because it is the end and the beginning. It's the eternal judgment of God. It's love. For God so loved that he gave. God is love. And so he does love, and so you will love. There is no why for God. And you must learn this. There is no why for God in you that is love in you. You can't make it happen. You must let it happen because it doesn't depend on you. You're like a virgin that conceives The angel appeared to Mary and told her of Jesus. She said, how could this be? Because I'm a virgin. And the angel said, therefore, for this reason, the child will be called holy. Because you didn't do it. It will be done unto you. Mary, said the angel, nothing will be impossible for God. And Mary said, let it be unto me according to thy word. 
You're like a virgin that conceives. I hope you know that Jesus never called himself, at least as far as we have any record in Scripture, he never called himself the son of Mary. But do you remember his favorite title for himself? It appears throughout Scripture. Yeah, son of man. And that means son of you. And so he took the bread and he broke it. Saying, this is my body given to you. He knew they would take it in the morning. But the night before he said, it's given to you, it's forgiven to you. And in the same manner, he took the cup. Saying, this is the covenant in my blood, this is the atonement. Argue about it uh, if, if you want. Consubstantiation, transubstantiation, spiritual presence, penal substitutionary atonement versus ransom theory versus all the other theories. Argue about it if you want, but you will not be able to comprehend this. However, this will comprehend you. So close your eyes and say these words after me. Let it be unto me according to your word. And so, Lord God, In the name of Jesus, we say, we let it be. We let you be in us. We let your mercy be in others. We let you make all things new. Even if it means the death of our own ego. God, that scares us. And yet I thank you that to be rid of that thing is to be entirely free. So all praise and glory and honor goes to you, our Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we say this, amen. And so the reason for the wrong in you is the revelation of the right. See, I think Paul calls it your old man, your false self, the flesh, this body of sin and death that eats life and poops something else. And the judgment of God The judgment of God is the reason for the wrong in you, and the judgment of God is the reason that is the right in you. Paul calls it your new man, the true man, Christ in you, the hope of glory. You see, your father does not take pleasure in punishing you. He takes pleasure in giving you himself and yourself and an entire new creation. So believe the gospel and let it be. Amen?